Dancing Circus. We have the three hottest tech companies. Hello, hot. Bachelor number one, bachelor number two. Um, so how the hottest enterprise tech companies thrive in high growth stages. I'm Diane Brady, and I am sitting, in fact, with three of the hottest enterprise tech companies, which you all probably know very well. Jay Simons, Atlassian, lots of banners here, and, uh, and such. We have Andy McLaughlin, formerly of, um, co-founder of Huddle, now a VC, but you're still there one day a week. Still, they still yeah. get the best of still you. Involved. And Dilawar Syed of Freshdesk. So I want to ask, first of all, how hot are you? No, but give, give me some sense, uh, Jay. Let's talk a little bit about Atlassian. And I'm curious, you've got, what, more than 43,000 customers, and yet you have no salespeople. So I call you up. Who am I dealing with? Do I put in a ticket and I just get my product? How can you continue to have no salespeople as you're getting that type of growth? Uh, primarily invest in products. You know, we believe that, the, especially today, the product should be able to sell itself. And so, uh, you know, our business model basically says we want to make it frictionless and easy for you to understand what we do. Very simple for you to try it. And then, you know, we'll provide great customer service along the way. So if you need help, like you can phone us up and say, you know, does it do this? How does it compare with, you know, with this other product? And we'll answer those questions. The people at the end of the phone, though, aren't really focused on closing you. They're focused on helping you. So and then we believe the rest of the model should support self-service. So is it just word of mouth? Is it just your spell? I mean, I'm just curious because I think that when we're talking about high growth, enterprise tech is one of these areas right now that everybody thinks is hot, but it's so broad you could drive a truck through it. So, I mean, give me some sense. As you grow to the next stage, is it just going to continue to be your policy? No salespeople, period, ever. Uh, I mean, never say never, but yeah, we believe with a customer base of 43,000, word of mouth is like a huge component of our growth. And we believe, but so is, so is the value proposition of a great product at affordable price. So in some ways, we're a lot like Costco, right? Like, you know, when you go into a Costco store, they've, the Costco store, they've curated the best products at the most affordable prices. They don't have a bunch of people that are trying to sell you a certain TV. And if you want to find somebody in a red vest to ask a question of, you can find them. But for the most part, they're going to answer your question and, you know, send you along the way. And so Andy is huddled more like Walmart? No. What, what is the, why, you, you have grown very quickly. At this time of all times, why walk away? Um, I think it got to the point where I just felt like I was throwing these very highly, highly polished spanners into the machine. I guess, you know, we'd hired a great, a great team. The team were executing really well. And I just felt like I was getting in the way. I was treading on people's toes. Um, and I'd been angel investing very actively for the last five years or so. I realized that's what I really enjoyed doing. I, you know, I have a bit of ADD, so I find it very hard to focus on one thing. So being able to take my hobby and do it as a full-time job was, a, was the second dream come true after I'd been able to do the first, the first time where I'd been able to start Huddle. So is high growth, was, was the growth at all a factor in your decision when to move on? I mean, I think that's an interesting challenge for many companies that grow quickly. To what extent does the job sort of move in a direction where you really need different talent in that seat. I think, I, yeah, I think that's right. And I think as we look at the evolution of Huddle over the years, you know, we've seen a lot of different people come through, people who were fantastic in the very early days, but maybe, you know, because of their temperance or their love, they, they didn't want to work in a much bigger company. And then you hire people that are much more executional, maybe slightly less entrepreneurial than the guys we had earlier, and, but they're just really good at getting stuff done. You know, and that's not to say these people are better than, than each other, it's just that they're different. And, um, you know, for me, we'd raised a big round. We raised about $52 million at the back end of last year. We hired a bunch of people, and it kind of felt like the, my baby had gone through its spotty teenage years. It was off to college, and it didn't really need to see its dad every day. So, you know, now I see it once a month when we have our board meetings, and, right. and that's enough. And she can pay for dinner and stuff. So, Dilawar, <laughs> you were much like Jay. You, you were brought to the company. What attracted you to Fresh Desk, first of all? And give me some sense as to you know, what you felt the management challenge was when you came into the president's role. Thank you, and uh, look, uh, Freshers has seen phenomenal growth, like, like you guys, growing from 4,000 customers two years ago to now 44,000, so 11-fold in, in just about two years. Uh, so what attracted me was one, growth, and two, um, you know, frankly, it's quite an inspiring story of global entrepreneurship. Now, actually, all of us are companies that were not founded in the Valley. Um, and just the passion of the team, uh, just the based, commitment of the team. You're based in? Based, uh, the founding location is in Chennai, but we are headquartered in, in San Francisco Australia, and offices in London UK. and Australia as well. It's a global, global company now. But the genesis was um, in, not in the valley. So that, that's what attracted me, and I, and I absolutely, you know, uh, I was aligned with the mission and what we're doing. 
in terms of the challenge, uh, and it's not, not different from, I guess, many of you in the audience, is how do you go from that 44K to the 100K mark, right, without dropping the ball? We have a very aggressive strategy with multiple products. We are, frankly, in a very competitive market. Um, but we are also at a time where customers expect a lot from you, thanks to social and mobile. So eating our own dog food, making sure we don't drop the ball with customer success, with customer adoption, with onboarding, with hiring the right people, retaining that culture globally. Those are all the things that I worry about, and that's why you know, some of us have come on board to help uh, take us to the next level. So these are, these are problems we all want to have to be sort of you know, hypercharged growth. What keeps you up at night? What's, what's your pain point right now in terms of looking at the landscape? Uh, you know, less about landscape and more about just growth, right? I think we're all probably high growth companies, and so the, the thing that keeps me up at night actually is, you know, Lassian's gonna add, you know, we'll end the year with 1,500 people and add 700 people in that year. And so, uh, you know, at the end of this year, half the company will be less than a year old. That's just a lot of people to simulate and make sure are connected to the culture and the market and customers and products. Does the culture change? Do you think about culture? Sure. I mean, when you're oh, hiring yeah, I mean, that quickly, you're just like, hey, come on in. We, we think about culture, culture a lot. Um, and yeah, the culture will change. Uh, the, you know, the values that the company's built on uh, shouldn't. So, you know, the advice that we give to young companies is think really early on about, you know, what values you, what does your company stand for? And what values do you want to build culture on top of? Because when you're, you know, 50 people, it's going to be one thing. When you're 150, another. When it's 10,000 people, hopefully, if you get to that stage, it'll be radically different. But presumably. So what do you look like this time next year? I'm going to ask all of you. Well, what is, how big, like, give me some sense of the, the growth trajectory oh, relative well, to Slack, well, GitHub. You've got lots of competitors out there. Well, we're, we're a, lot, a lot bigger than, than those guys, than the, the companies you mentioned. You know, we're, we've, you know, we've been growing at a compound annual rate of, of 45% over the past five years. So, you know, we are more than doubling as a business every two years. So a year from now, we'll be, you know, close to half a doubling. Does the challenge change? I mean, give me some sense of what your priorities are right now and how you're essentially focusing your energies. Build great product, right? Like improve the product, uh, reach as much of the market as you can, listen to, you know, without a, you know, a, a forward-leaning sales organization, we rely a lot on kind of in-product customer feedback and insights that we gain in product about what we need to improve in order to reach the next kind of milestone of big customer acquisition. So it's always, you know, if, if you line up Atlassian relative to almost any other uh, peer of our size, we're going to be at the far end in terms of R&D as a percentage of revenue, far, far end of one extreme. And we'll be at the far end of the other extreme in terms of sales and marketing. And we believe that that's right size. You know, if sales, salesforce.com uh, is an example, great successful company. But it's interesting that as a product company, they invest 18% in R&D and 55% or 60% in sales and marketing. We think that's backwards. Okay. Yeah. And I, th I think what that shows, though, is that it's kind of different strokes for different folks. And we, when we look at lots and lots of different companies, you know, lots of great companies, they have very different makeups. I think when Box filed the rest one last year, you know, they were a great example of a company that spent a lot of money on sales and marketing. They spent 150% or 200% of revenue on, on, on s and I remember there being a TechCrunch article about how San Francisco had an s and problem, and that was the, um, the thing that they San flagged. San Francisco has an s and problem. Exactly. Here it does, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you know, the, the, the thing is, right, not every company takes the same path. And you know, what worked for Atlassian and what worked for Basecamp and what works for Box and Dropbox may not work for the guys in the room here. And I think that when you're starting your company, you kind of have to say, you know, what do we believe, you know, what do we think is going to work? And also, you have to be prepared to roll with the punches as well, because you know, I would say that probably nine times out of 10, the business model that you choose at the very beginning is going to be a complete fucking disaster. And you have to kind of pivot around so and actually find something that, that genuinely does work. If you could go back and do it all over again, is there anything that you would do differently? Would you tell anybody any advice around even sort of the mix of VC funding that you get? Because, you know, you end up inviting people to the table earlier on that you don't necessarily want to stay for supper. I mean, and yet they own part of your company and you're like, so, you know, okay. I think we, we've been very lucky in that the VCs that we've had involved have always been incredibly, like, you know, they've been great guys. They've been very supportive. You know, they really understood the business and kind of followed the vision. We were lucky, right? I know I know lots of companies where that hasn't been the case, where they brought VCs on, they raised too much money. You know, now when I'm talking to my companies about, you know, how they think about the, uh, the strategy for cash, raise as much as you need. Don't raise too little, don't raise too much. And there was actually an episode of Silicon Valley, the, I think the first episode that talked about this our, exact our thing. Our gold standard for all business management strategy. Well, well, absolutely. And, you know, and it's fucking crazy that we should be thinking about a, an HBO comedy for how you know, I tell companies to think about their business. But 
what I they said, Game which was... I Thrones for managing my children, so it's good. Yeah. There, there's a lot of role models there. And, you know, what they said was raise the right amount of money because I know companies that raise too much. They then did a down round and the founder was thrown out and, you know, before you know it, it's, it's you know, dead in the water. So, Delauer, I want to ask a little bit about the competitive landscape. There's been a lot of attention to Zendesk, the Fresh Desk, the... You know, when you're in a hot space, there's the spotlight comes on. How does that affect how you interact with customers, the swirl? I mean, how much does that prove to be a distraction or does it in fact provide fuel for more people to understand what you do? You know, where we spend um, all our energies and our focus is on our business, on our customers. Uh, when you have a game such a high your press? growth. I'm sorry? You don't read the press. No, I'm kidding. Um, well, the press probably the about press us. Reads you. you know, so I, I think really, I mean, honestly, when you have growth of this kind and such a large team, we are about 400 people globally now, my day is filled with managing um, that growth and helping us grow and make sure customers are successful. Clearly, we are in a competitive market. Uh, we appreciate the competition, and that's fair. Um, but, you know, I would, I would say this. If you look at it, if you really step back, um, in the year 2015, there is no reason why we should have products that look like what they looked like 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, or 20 years ago. And some of these companies have been around since that time. Um, consumers or business users who are using our products today, uh, for any of the enterprise, they grew up in a consumer age, playing games, you know, being on Facebook and Snapchat, so they expect uh, something more from that experience. So that's where the opportunity space is for us, and that's where we are focused on. You were asking earlier what keeps us up at night is not the competition. It, what keeps us up at night is that increasingly our base is getting very complex. So we have large SMBs, we have mid-market customers. We are also mission critical for solar cities and 3M and Birkins of the world to make sure that we can scale for a complexity of that, of that nature uh, for a platform that enables uh, customer service for 45, 50 million users worldwide. That's what keeps us up at night and focused Honestly, not um, another brand or appear in the market, uh, you know, and, and just making sure that our folks are happy with, with, with what we are providing. So I think one thing that's interesting is give us a sense of the landscape. You mentioned what's, I mean, enterprise tech obviously has been around. We have a lot of behemoths that have been in the space, the Oracles, the Cisco's, the Salesforce's. What do you see changing, especially, you know, you came to the role, you came in a different role, basically, into the company in what, 08, I guess? What have you seen, what makes it particularly interesting right now? Are there different gatekeepers in terms of who actually is the decision maker around the tech coming into the company? Give us some sense of the opportunities. Sure, uh, I, there's a couple of things. Um, some of them sound like cliches, but I think a lot of the reason that the, the behemoths are under threat you know, is the, uh, you know, the rapid adoption of cloud and the fact that a lot of those companies haven't been able to move uh, as fast as the cloud because they're encumbered by kind of the legacy, you know, the legacy infrastructure models that they built. Um, I think the, the other big change is mobile. And uh, I think they're, they're all in a race to sort of embrace how a lot of us interact with, you know, systems, you know, back at our companies. And then maybe the biggest one, the most pronounced one is just user expectation. Uh, and user experience and design. So, you know, enterprise software isn't usually a category where you think this is a beautifully designed product and, you know, when I come to work and I use it, um, I feel great about it. Like most of the software that people use inside of businesses doesn't elicit that reaction. And I think that's changing and that's not an easy thing to do. It's not like you just hire a bunch of designers and say make, you know, make the, you know, slickify the user experience. You have to actually think how are people going to interact with that. And I think the, the products that are the most, getting the most attention right now, I think are demonstrating that they invest in user experience and design as a first order priority. Do consumer tech companies have a natural advantage when they suddenly say, you know, we're going after the enterprise customer? Is that like, you, you know, Facebook for the enterprise? Bringing I, I, don't, well, I don't think so. I don't think there's any, there's any real, I'd have to think of it, like outside of Google, if there's any real, you know, real example of a company that's successfully done that. Yeah, and, and if I may just add to what Jay just said in terms of what's different about enterprise, and I have a vantage point because I worked at Siebel a while, while back, that um, some of our biggest customers have actually come to us inbound. We didn't even reach out. It's a fundamentally different way of it, how so we sold hunger, software there's before. There's a hunger for disrupting. They, kind they're of the coming to you via Google Ads. And when we are demoing them, we may not even often know how big they might be. And often they grow from a department thanks to, again, pull from their user base. And then there's a champion in the, within the enterprise who is then growing the account. So our role becomes more of a customer success than necessarily outbound selling. And that, that's where, you know, as the next-gen companies here, 
we are focusing more on the product experience and onboarding experience, the customer success so as opposed to hard selling. I want to ask each of you, now Andy, because you're now in a VC role, you know, sprinkling fairy dust and money <laughs> to the masses, give me some sense of what's fascinating to you on the landscape. I mean, help us see around the corner in terms of what we'll be talking about this time. Next year, where you see the opportunities, are you wholly focused, for example, on enterprise tech as the space to invest in? Yeah, so you know, I, I'm looking almost exclusively at B2B, and I don't actually like the term enterprise tech, because I think there's, you know, there's- B2B? Yeah, there's lots of B2B stuff that doesn't necessarily fall into what we would traditionally have called enterprise. I think there's a couple of things. I mean, I love developer tools. I love the tools that all the guys in the room here and all the guys out there are gonna be using to build their products with. Because, you know, I think that, I don't want to say we're in a bubble, right, but we, cer we certainly are in a bit of a gold rush. It's kind of analogous so, so to the gold rush. So what's overhyped? I don't know about overhyped. I mean, you are certainly overpriced companies, but fuck, you know, if they can go out at the, at the valuations that, that they can get, then good luck to them. Right. But when you consider that every single company out there is going to be using a GitHub to manage their code, they're going to be using Dropbox or Box and Atlassian to kind of help kind of run their process. It's not kind of like with the gold rush in the 1800s. It wasn't the guys with shovels that made money. It was, it was the guys who, was actually, who were actually kind of selling the shovels. And so I, want, you know, I would prefer to fund those guys. The other thing that's really exciting, though, is highly verticalized SaaS. I think that a lot of the very broad stuff is getting played out now. I mean, I probably wouldn't invest in another document management system or in another collaboration system just because there are so many people doing that. But if somebody came to me and said, I've got an awesome product to manage uh, medical offices globally, or I've got a product to manage shipping and, fr um, and freight. That's super interesting because these are industries that are still using that really ugly, really boring technology. Right. Stuff that feels like a Soviet calculator to touch and use. And what about yourself? What's fascinating? Get help us even in terms of where you think you'll be and, and some of the opportunities that you're seeing. Uh, well, I mean, uh, similarly, like we're we're focused on uh, very technical teams, in part because uh, you've heard the thesis that you know every company is becoming a software company, uh, and I think that's a big secular shift. You know, uh, General Motors, I think it was just a month ago, canceled a three billion dollar outsourcing agreement with Hewlett Packard, uh, are insourcing all of their technology strategy, and you know, going from a thousand developers and to eighty five hundred. they'll make cars again too. No, I'm kidding. Well, I mean, I think they recognize that, you know, they're not just, like, they're, no company is the thing that they started doing. Right. Like, technology, they have to be a technology first version of that thing, otherwise they'll get disrupted. So, uh, you know, and we, we fundamentally care about improving the way that people work around that particular process or project. And then we believe that most of the way people work and communicate and create and share information and, and kind of move work around an organization is fundamentally broken. And so, like, you know, the, the, you know, the big mission for Atlassian is to, um, you know, empower people to work better and, okay. and change the pe people work inside of their businesses. What about yourself? So I think in our case, um, we feel at Fresh Test we have barely scratched the, the, the surface. Thanks to mobile and social, it's companies of all sizes that are looking for a tool to provide customer support. And our mission is to democratize the use of that tool, just like SurveyMonkey has done for surveys and Gmail has done for email. And to, so today when we have 45K customers, it can grow to 100K and plus and SMBs, enterprises, mid-market, across the world. So, um, you know, it's, it's really delivering on that core that we have. But when you start to deliver, Dana, one more thing that's happening is we are noticing that folks are asking more of you. So as a company, we do have a multi-part strategy. More of us Salesforce models, we launch fresh services more on IT service management, and there are hopefully more to come down the road. So uh, we, we think a core actually the, 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 you know, the, just in, in and itself, there is a huge opportunity to actually oh, do more. Let me ask, before I ask you all to sum up and give our, your, your haiku moments and, and advice to the crowd, but give me some sense from the customer point of view. I'm a big company, small, co and, and I'm working with all of you guys. What advice do you have for the enterprises themselves, which are feeling, you know, some paranoia. They're bringing, you know, everybody's bringing their iPhones to work. You know, there's Russian hackers somewhere off doing something. What advice do you have in terms of how to engage with these hot growth companies, especially, I'm gonna start with you, I call you up and there's no salespeople. What is my, what's your advice to me in terms of how to be thinking about what tools I should be using? Uh, well, first of all, I mean, we, we believe you shouldn't need necessarily a salesperson, you shouldn't need help. You'll get it if you want it and you ask for it, no, but if we've done our job the right way, uh, you can go through that process on your own without actually needing somebody to convince but you of anything. You should be able to convince yourself. If I'm the CIO, should I just be sort of like trying to disrupt my legacy I think the CIO's got to go to the teams and the people that they're trying to empower and say, like, first of all, what are you using? What do you need? Right? I, I think that the days of CIO top-down driven technology decisions are over, in part because there's just so much shelfware. Like, there's a decade 
of crap that the CIO bought because somebody sold it to them that kind of sat unused. And I think those days are over in part because there's so much freedom of choice of people inside of businesses. And actually, the economics are radically in their favor. Like, if you consider all of us, like, most of us are priced, you know, at a cup of coffee per user per day or per week. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. It's not and the it's very hundreds well. of thousands right. of dollars. And it's very Keep simple. I mean, Hip, Hip Chat's one of our products that's just free, right? The whole thing is just free. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of companies that are driving innovation and freedom of choice for okay. businesses that the CIO, I think, should listen to that. Any, any advice? For me, the CIO or? Yeah, I mean, I, I think firstly would be to look, look beyond the traditional stack, right? Look beyond Microsoft, look beyond IBM, look beyond SAP. You know, with the world of APIs now, you can buy best of root solutions to the different parts and knit them together. I think secondly, talk to your users, right? Find out what they actually want. What are they using? What are they excited about using? What are you going to buy that isn't going to be the same shelfware piece of crap that you bought five years ago? And then the second thing, or rather the third thing is, don't be boxed by a low price. You know, when a, when a cloud company comes in and gives you a number, just because it's 10x less than what you were paying before doesn't make it crap. In fact, it probably makes it way better, and it's going to make you look like a hero. So, so we are in play with some of the largest companies now, brands that is happening faster than, frankly, even I expected. But I'll tell you that the fundamental difference why the fear factor should be less and it's becoming less on the part of CIO. It is no longer rip and replace that, oh, I spent five years building this system with Accenture, eating my <laughs> dark food, and now I have to rip and replace. You can actually trial parts like Freshdesk without you know, doing anything else to your architecture and see how it's working for you. So often by the time they sign the contract with us, the system is ready to go live because there is no system per se. There's no implementation. Right. So the technology makes it much easier, if you will, to trial it, to embrace that. Okay. And I think they can sort of proof, proof concept that in the, in the sales cycle before they turn the switch on. So we're out of time. Any final words you want to throw that we haven't touched? Any advice? Go and no? build great, great companies. Okay. Do awesome things. Okay, excellent. And then come and see me. At Ghost, yes, exactly, especially if you're in some of the businesses he wants to throw money at. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Great conversation. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.